My sister later asked her, their best friends asked her, what made you change your mind? She said, I fell in love with the boys. I had two sons. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I keep working at it. She put a sign. When Jill wants me to get a message, maybe you guys have the same thing, or you women, she puts up a, she pastes little notes on the mirror where I shave and finish it. And she found this, uh, this, this saying somewhere, she said, stop trying to make me love you. <laughs> She put it up two weeks ago. Uh, um, well, Harold, a true friend doesn't support you. That's not enough. They make you want to be a better version of yourself. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Harold, you've been that kind of friend to me. Someone Jill and I admire and someone with the passion and drive that, uh, for the people you serve. You know, what a, uh, what a heart for the firefighters and their families. Your leaders who uh, never stop fighting for, uh, for, what's, uh, uh, for what's right, and you inspire us. And uh, so, uh, so thank you for, for all you do. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'd like you all to... Uh, I appreciate the energy you showed when I got up here. Um, uh, save it a little longer. I may need it in a few weeks. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. You know, uh, my grandfather, Finney, used to say, Joey, your labor from belt buckle to shoe sole. That's how I was raised. And there's no labor leader who's done a better job for the men and women they represent uh, than you have, Harold. You know, you bleed for your people. Every firefighter injured, every firefighter lost, every firefighter struggling for their health care. This guy feels it, as does the rest of your leadership. And frankly, that's the kind of leader you need and you deserve. Because, because you know, being a firefighter, as Jill pointed out, is not just your job. It's not just your profession. It's a brotherhood. It's a sisterhood. You know, the expression in the military is the same you have. Leave nobody behind. That's because you do what no one else would do. You run toward danger. You run into burning buildings and raging forest fires. You put your lives on the line every day for strangers, people you don't know, and maybe even some people you don't like if you knew them. <laughs> At least I feel that way sometimes. <laughs> and when your work is done, you always say the exact same thing. I've been to 50 fire scenes while the fire is going on in my hometown. And you always say the same thing. Just doing my job, Joe. Just doing my job. Well, you've been with me a long time. Quite frankly, I wouldn't be here, wouldn't be in this room. I got elected to the United States Senate as a 29-year-old kid in 1972 because of your support. And that's not hyperbole. It's just a simple fact. You see, when I was a 29-year-old kid, there were three parties in Delaware. And this is what we always say of those, anyone from Delaware here. It's either Democrats, Republicans, and firefighters. Not a joke. Not a joke. And if you were smart, you went with the firefighters. I did. I went with the firefighters. But politics is the least of what you've done for me. My, uh, my fire service saved the lives of my two sons. I can repeat myself, but I, we, we feel so deeply indebted. In December of 72, when my wife was bringing home a Christmas tree, a tractor trailer was broadsided. Killed my wife, killed my daughter. It took about an hour and a half, I'm told, for the jaws of life of my fire company to save my boys, who in all likelihood, I'm told, would have died as well, severely injured. You saved my life in the middle of a blizzard, literally a blizzard. Sent, President Reagan offered to send a helicopter to get me to a neurosurgeon at Walter Reed because I had two cranial aneurysms. One was bleeding. And they gave me a 30 percent chance of living, but my fire service and an ambulance got me got me down to, to Washington in the middle of a snowstorm into Walter Reed. And a 12-hour operation saved my life. 
I'll never forget the guys from the fire service. Two young guys were trying to get the gurney in, and it wouldn't collapse, you know, and they were having trouble. And Jill, to calm them down, looked at me and said, Joe, you ruin everything. It's Valentine's Day. <laughs> and I looked at him. <laughs> As Jill told you, saved her home. Believe me, I know better than most just how true the old saying is. All men and women are, cre all men and women are created equal. Then a few become firefighters. So Jill and I owe you. Your neighbors owe you. The American people owe you more than they have any idea how much they owe you until they need you. That's why, as Vice President Howell pointed out, I was, I was so proud in the middle of the Great Recession to put real money in the Recovery Act, keeping your fire stations open and countless firefighters on the job. That's why I've been so proud to support and be a defender of the SAFERS grant. And we owe, he's not here, but we owe Senator Dodd a debt of gratitude for what he did. He's the guy. But I sure don't. I sure don't have to tell anyone in this room what it's meant to you. You know, what people don't realize is on a per capita basis, more of your women and men are injured and die than law enforcement officers do on a per capita basis. The thing you need most is more firefighters to have your back. What I don't get... <laughs> But what I don't get is why we still have to keep fighting for this funding. They're critical to your safety and the safety of local communities all across America without exception. Maybe because, as I said, I'm a union guy, labor, labor makes a gigantic difference. But I don't see any reason why you should be denied the right to collective bargaining. Who the hell are these guys? Really, think about it. Think about how basic it is. Why are we even having this argument? I just don't get it. You should have the same rights as everyone else. You've earned it. And I certainly know from personal experience you've earned it. It reminds me of the fight we had back in 86 over overtime pay for firefighters. Isn't it amazing how these guys who call themselves public servants, the guys creating all the jobs for shareholders and all, and I want to get into that, but, <laughs> you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think it was very complicated. You deserve to be paid overtime for the hours you work like everybody else, although they're trying to deny overtime for everybody else by reclassifying them as managers. So you work in a grocery store and you're stacking the ragu spaghetti and you control the guy or the woman who brings out the cart, you're a manager. No, not a joke. And so you don't get paid overtime. Denied about $10 billion a year. Hourly workers are denied. It took the Supreme Court decision to get it done for you guys. And we keep asking. They keep asking. We keep asking. More and more of you to deal with fires made more intense and dangerous by climate change. How many of you are a little bit older who thought you'd have to learn how to deal with terrorist weapons and gases and weapons of mass destruction, for God's sake? You do it all, everything. And just look at California. 2018 was the most destructive wildfire season ever. And they deal with gun violence. Instead of giving you what you need, especially more firefighters, we make you fight for everything you get. I just don't get it. I really don't. This is one of the areas I don't get. Maybe it's because I've known so many of you from the ranks who've been willing to make the ultimate sacrifice that I'll never understand people who fight you on the, on, on the basics, like safety, fair play, Health care. My God. I was going to stay away from this, but I can't. <laughs> Did you see the budget was just introduced? It cuts, it cuts $845 billion 
almost a trillion dollar cut in Medicare. And almost a quarter trillion, $240 billion cut in Medicaid. Why? Because of a tax cut for the super wealthy that created a deficit of $1.9 trillion, and now they got to go make somebody pay for it. Something that gave millionaires and billionaires excessive tax breaks. And who are they asking to pay for it? Middle class families like you, the neighborhood I grew up in. Trading Medicare and Medicaid for tax breaks? How that's going to help anybody in this room or most of the people you live with? How's that going to help this country? Harold, you and I have been to too many funerals and memorial services together. I was thinking about it as Jill and I were talking last night coming back in the plane. I had the great honor of being a speaker at the Granite Mountain Hot Shots in Arizona in 2013. <clears throat> 19 firefighters <clears throat> who lost their lives living by the motto. Not hyperbole, living by the motto. Duty, integrity, respect. You guys use those words, but I don't know that you fully appreciate just how much you embody that. Not a joke. Not a joke. You know, I'm thinking about honor, how honored I was to be asked to speak at the 34th Fallen Firefighters Memorial Service in 15 in Maryland, where we remember 85 firefighters who had given their lives in service to us all. And closer to home, not long ago, I was thinking about people. <coughs> Jerry Ficus, Christopher Leach. Neath the hope, they all lost their lives in the line of duty in an apartment complex about two miles from my house. I was there, went down on the scene. I was proud to participate in the service to celebrate their lives and recognize their sacrifices in 16, meet their kids and their families. They're left with a legacy of honor, without a father, without a mother. It took some com comfort knowing that the public safety benefit program that Harold talked about is going to be there for them. We put together scholarship funds for the kids, and, like you always do, trying to make sure we don't leave anybody behind, including their kids. Their children will be now part of a fraternity and a sorority that will be with them the rest of their lives. Some comfort, but not enough. Is still on your list of priorities, the 9-11 Victims' Compensation Fund. Why are the hell we arguing about that still? Why is that even being argued? It must be permanently funded, period. Permanently funded, period. Permanently funded. Why is there even a debate? Folks, this is America. I really mean it. We have basic, basic, basic moral obligations as Americans. There's no doubt of the damage caused to these firefighters. You know, I visited the site a few days after the attack, and I stood there and turned the corner. I looked as I felt as I was looking through the gates of hell. But an image, an image I came away with, the image I had in my mind's eye, was that same image that all Americans had <clears throat> of that grizzled firefighter literally rising out of the dust, grit and determination written on his face. That single image, when America needed images, lifted us off our knees, filled us with hope, inspired us and reminded us of who we are. It sent a signal to the world, you can knock us down, but you can never beat us. Never, never, never beat us. Think about it. You know, shortly, shortly after that, I visited in Afghanistan, a temporary prison camp. 
when American troops went in to take on the Taliban. You know what was hanging over this large hangar that had been converted into a temporary restraining place? It wasn't the picture of a general or a military. It was that fireman. That fireman. Our military. Our military. About an eight by ten big photograph. The resilience on his face said it all. There is no quit in America. There never has been, and there never will be, because of you. And I really think, as usual, you guys underestimate the impact you have on the community and at that moment on our nation and on the world. I think about that time after 9-11 a lot these days. We were so united. Today, we seem to beat each other's throats. The ugliest extremism is on the rise in this country. We saw it most vividly in Charlottesville. Mean pettiness has overtaken our politics. Sometimes it seems like we can't govern ourselves or even talk to one another. If you notice, I get criticized for saying anything nice about a Republican. Folks, that's not who we are. That's not how we got here. We have to remember what it is that makes this nation so special. It's our core values. It's what we believe. It sounds corny, but it's the American creed. I mean, for real. We hold these truths self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We've never met the standard, but we've never walked away from it. We've never backed off. It sounds corny, but that's who Americans are. We. And I believe I really mean it. That's who we are. I believe, I believe there's what the columnist David Brooks calls an invisible moral fabric that holds this nation up, holds us together. And it's pretty basic. It's made up of the values that define us best as Americans. Not a joke. Honesty. Decency. Treating people with dignity and respect. Giving everyone a fair shot. Leaving nobody behind. Demonizing no one, not the poor, not the desperate, not the immigrant, not the other. Protecting our right to speak and practice any faith that we hold without fear of reprisal. Leading by the power of our example, not just the example of our power and standing as a beacon to the world. That's why the rest of the world repairs to us. It's the example of our power, not alone. It's the power of our example. And maybe what no group understands better than you guys, understanding that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. There's something bigger than us we're part of. You live it. That's who we are. We know that, and you know that. We got to remind the country of it. You're part of the very fabric of your community. You're the folks who take off your gear after a long shift, jump into your car and head to the Little League field to line it because you promised that you would do it. You're the men and women who take the trucks out of the fire hall set up the tables for potluck dinners, raise money for the person whose house you couldn't save and lost all their clothing to give them help. You're the people who show up at your church for the bake sale because part of the roof collapsed in a snowstorm. You're the ones who stand in the corner of every American city with those boots after you've already done your shift, collecting money to help those, those with neuromuscular diseases. You not only have courage and stamina, you have really big and generous hearts. You don't like admitting it, because somehow it's not that masculine or something. 
but you're all suckers. <laughs> Think about it, guys. Think about it. How many people can you walk by who need help? It is not hyperbole to suggest you are the heart and the soul, the sinew and the backbone of this country. And you're the reason that I have so much confidence in our country's future as tough as times look right now. Because when I look around this room, I see the people who built this nation. The country wasn't built by Wall Street bankers and CEOs and hedge fund managers. They're not, they're not necessarily bad. They didn't build this country. It was built by the great American middle class, and unions built the middle class. It was built, built by people like you, who knew, you knew as my dad knew, the job is about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. And mean it. That's the American story. The story of ordinary people from neighborhoods that you and I grew up in doing extraordinary things. That's how we built the greatest nation in the history of the world. The reason for it is because we become the most powerful nation because we have the most powerful idea in the history of the world. And that idea beats in the heart of the people of this country. You know, we can't be defined. We're not able to be defined by race, by religion, by tribe, we're defined by those enduring principles that are in the Constitution, even though we don't necessarily all know them. That's what defines us. That in America, everybody gets a shot. That's what the next president of the United States needs to understand, and that's what I don't think this current president understands at all. Unless you think I'm kidding, try to define an American based on race. Try to define one based on religion, on ethnicity. No other democracy in the world is like ours. There's uniting features of being Brit or French or German or Chinese or Japanese, but not America. We can only define an American by their commitment to those self-evident truth stated in the Constitution. That's why they say it's not hyperbole. America was an idea. It is an idea. It's an idea that goes, an idea that goes back to our founding. An idea that we spent over 200 years trying to live up to. An idea that generation after generation has opened its arms just a little bit wider to include those who are being excluded. So it keeps pushing us towards justice toward the more perfect union. We're not there, we're not likely to get there, but we've always kept pushing for it. My dad used to say, Joey, everybody, everybody in the world, everybody in America deserves to be treated with dignity. Not a joke, everybody. My father would no more walk by the shoeshine guy in the Hotel DuPont than he walked by the chairman of the board of the Hotel DuPont. It's been over two centuries, and it's still our North Star today. If we remember that in the 21st century, the 21st century will be an American century. Folks, look, when I was a, uh, got elected as a 29-year-old kid because of, and I won by 3,100 votes, so I'm not joking about the fire service. Despite, I was, I was referred to as a young idealist. I was an optimist. Well, despite our, all of our problems today, I mean this sincerely, I'm more optimistic about our nation's future than I was when I was that 29-year-old kid. Think about it. We have the largest economy in the history of the world. We're the richest nation in the world. 
We have the strongest military in all of world history. We have the most innovative entrepreneurs in the world, the most agile venture capitalists. We are virtually energy independent, something that was beyond our possibilities a few years ago and does not apply to China and so many other nations. And the fact is, we have the most productive workers in the world, three times as productive as workers in Asia. And we have more great research universities in the United States of America than all the rest of the world combined. And if you doubt me, as my wife, the professor, say, Google it. <laughs> There's no reason why we can't own the 21st century. And the rest of the world needs us to lead. Who fills the vacuum? if we continue to walk away and walk off the world stage. We just got to get out of our own way. Remember who the hell we are. This is the United States of America. There is nothing we are unable to do. Nothing we've ever tried had we failed at. This is America, so it's time to get up. Remember who the hell we are. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops and our firefighters. Thank